Thanks for asking me. So tell me about Finsbury Park as it was when you lived there. When I lived there, it was a very typical North London neighbourhood, best known for probably to football soccer fans as the home of the Arsenal football ground. It was sort of run down. It had been working class, worked a couple of railway yards, that kind of thing. Um, quite a big Irish population and also from one of Britain's other European colonies, Cyprus, quite a lot of uh, Greek and Turkish Cypriots. But, but despite these sort of minor ethnic and national fault lines, um, no violence. And what is it now? Well, now it, like a number of other neighborhoods, has become settled by people from um, the Muslim diaspora, shall I call it that, um, largely from North Africa, in the case of Finsbury Park, but also quite a heavy presence of people from Pakistan. And what's happened as a result of that is, well, two things. One in Finsbury Park, um, a famous mosque um, led by a man named uh, Hamza, now in jail for inciting terrorism and murder and racial hatred. Uh, but, and through that mosque past people like Richard Reed, in whose honor we all take off our shoes at the airport now, and several other people who've been responsible for, for very heinous crimes. And second, it, this is a related matter, but it's separate though. Um, the importing into Britain from tribal areas, really, of Pakistan, of things like arranged marriages, forced marriages, actually, um, marriages often to people who are first cousins, uh, leading to things like birth defects, uh, honor killings, um, the imprisonment of women in their houses, and a number of other things that are culturally very alarming. So do you think these things sort of worked together to make Finsbury Park a potential uh, you know, incubator of jihadist? It, without the rhetoric and, and activity of Hamza, would the Pakistani immigration have had such an effect and vice versa? Uh, no, the answer is that uh, the two things have to be considered separately, but that one does provide a context for the other. In other words, there have been some very upsetting findings from opinion polls of younger Muslims, particularly in Britain, who show that they not just want to impose Sharia law on the country, and in the meantime, on their own population, especially their own females, um, I say that advisedly because they, I think they think of their women as in some sense their property, um, and their willingness to endorse the actions of, of murderers of the kind that we saw, fortunately, um, aborted uh, or abortive uh, last week. What did you think when you heard about those arrests? Well, I had the same sense I had uh, a few a couple of years ago, in the, uh, the anniversary is coming up on the 7th of July, 7-7, as Londoners call it, um, that I knew it was coming. Really? An awful, an awful sense the, of not being surprised or shocked, but deeply, deeply depressed at the thought that this, is, this problem has been imported right into the heart of England, and, and um, this is going to go on for a very long time and get much worse. So not surprised in a general sense because another attack is inevitable or because of the 7-7 anniversary? Um, because I thought another one was inevitable. Mm -hmm. Actually, I hadn't particularly noticed the anniversary until the newspapers pointed it out to me. Do you think the British government has a hand in that? Has a hand in it? Well, no, I mean, not in, not in creating it, but in, in the atmosphere that you've described in Finsbury Park. Do you think they have a role? Uh, no, the British government, uh, usually British authorities, as I say in my piece, generally were perfectly happy to neglect poor old Finsbury Park. And I often think we were better off when they did, because it was only when the royal family, for example, took an interest in the odious Prince Charles, who pretends to be a great friend and perhaps is of Islam, um, encouraged the building of this mosque in Finsbury Park with the money from his friends in the Saudi Arabian royal family. Uh, we could have done without this intervention from the crowned heads in our, in our little community, frankly. Let's hear from Jack in Redding, California. Jack, welcome to Talk of the Nation. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Hitchens, I, I believe, is about the only man on the face of the earth who actually would remember the classic words of the Bishop of Antioch in 300 A.D. when he, he was asked about proselytizing for religions. And he said, you must proselytize those that are simple and easily led. And I wondered if, uh, if you, might, uh, you might make a comment in that respect. Uh, that being a hue and cry of one of your countrymen, uh, a defined uh, emeritus professor 
uh, Anthony Flew, and I'll take my answer off the air. <laughs> well, here um, it might be a moment if, if it wouldn't seem uh, opportunist to recommend my, my new book, which is called God is Not Great. It's an attack on organized religion and on the incessant way in which religion can't keep itself to itself, does insist on converting and trying to uh, spread the word to others, either by force or by fraud, as you imply, sir. Yes, so uh, the, uh, the, there's a very serious um, a danger from fundamentalist mosques, not just in England, uh, but elsewhere, that they, they're, they're not content just to preach their own religion, uh, but they insist on, on spreading it, and they often imply that there can be no peace until everyone in the world has become converted. Let's hear from Dave in Torrance, California. Welcome to Talk of the Nation. Yes, hello. Uh, my, actually, before my question, I just wanted to make a brief comment. Uh, Mr. Hitchens, your, your writing is absolutely tremendous. I really appreciate your articles. They, uh, the, the way you write is, is very, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to read. Thank you. My question, you're welcome. My question is, uh, what do you think is the difference uh, between the, the Muslim, Muslim population in the area that you grew up in the neighborhood that you're talking about versus the uh, Muslims in in this in this country, America. Um, I think the population of this country is different, the Muslim population, in that it's uh, very much more uh, diverse. There are a lot of, for example, I think probably the largest single group of um, people from a Muslim country in America is from Iran. Um, many of them are refugees from theocracy and certainly wouldn't want to have any more babble of that kind while they were here, They're very, especially in the state where I'm talking to you from, California, uh, a very distinguished and, and um, uh, educated uh, group. Uh, of, the, the, of course, Iran does have a bad history with the United States, which I won't go into now, but the, it leads me to my next point, which is the problem with the Muslim immigrants to Britain is that many of them come from former British colonies. So the, the whole relationship to begin with is a little bit distraught. Second, but many of them do come from extremely educated and, and advanced um, and sophisticated populations in East Africa, Uganda and Kenya most notably, who were thrown out by African nationalists, um, partly because they were jealous of their business success. Um, and these have done extremely well, and we're all very grateful to them. They've, among other things, revolutionized British cuisine, made it a great deal more tasty than it used to be, <clears throat> which it needed. But yeah, um, many, of them come from, many of them come from extremely backward parts of Pakistan, where... As I say, the idea of the jihad is still very much alive, as is the practice of things like arranged marriages, dowries, the forcible veiling of women, and so forth. So it's a, it's a related cultural and political problem. There's no analogy to that, as far as I'm aware, in the United States. Well, you know, there's, there's not no moderate educated Muslims in England. Do you think that... To the contrary, you see, we, we've had a lot of very distinguished authors. So do you think they can make, make a difference in London, or or in the UK? Oh, very much so. I mean, the, uh, the, the warning sounds of this were, were given off quite a long time ago by very distinguished authors, some of them friends of mine, like uh, Hanif Qureshi, for example, uh, who some of your listeners will know and will have read, Salman Rushdie, Monica Ali, who wrote a brilliant book called Brick Lane, describing another Muslim ghetto in East London. And a, a lot of people wish now that they paid more attention to these people who were from Muslim backgrounds, saying, look, take this seriously. It's going to become very nasty. You don't lack at all for educated um, and usually secular uh, Muslim voices in, in the United Kingdom. It's just that some of our social policies have tended to empower people who speak and claim to represent their see, on the basis of being an imam or a mullah. Uh, you, you outline in Vanity Fair... Um, say, for instance, local law enforcement going to the imam in the mosque rather than talking to more secular members of the neighborhood? Yes, there's too, there's too uh, swift an assumption made that those who um, are the preachers in the community are, are its voices and representatives. And what this does is, very much to the annoyance of my secular friends, is cut them out of the process by which, say, <clears throat> uh, police officers work or indeed social services are distributed. It, it tends to enthrone of these people probably rather more than they deserve. The article in Vanity Fair is called Londonistan, Londonistan Calling. The title is taken from a book called Londonistan, which uh, criticizes multiculturalism as being destructive to British values. Do you agree with that? 
Um, well, I don't agree with Melanie Phillips's book altogether, all no, as a matter of fact, but it isn't her title. Um, the original uh, term, Londonistan, which has obviously begun, begun to stick now and circulate, comes from a French counter-terrorism official um, who'd been monitoring extremists from, from French-speaking North Africa, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia in particular, and had noticed that an extraordinary number of them were, a were able to take refuge in London as as if they were seeking political asylum or as if they were human rights refugees, whereas, in fact, they were extremely dangerous, wanted criminals in their own countries. You're listening to Talk of the Nation from NPR News. Let's hear from Joel in Jacksonville, Florida. Joel, welcome to Talk of the Nation. Hey, how are you all doing today? Good. You're on the air, Joel. Yes, um, I was just wondering if, if uh, you know, we're looking at the the situation as it is today, but to... But, uh, Maybe, Mr. Hitchens, if you could explore the root causes of, of the, the anger that uh, a lot of Muslims have towards Western nations, uh, and if, if this is somewhat of uh, the hens coming home to roost, so to speak, um, and, uh, and, and maybe uh, Western nations paying for meddling in, in areas that maybe we shouldn't have been meddling in. Well, no, I've got absolutely no patience with, with that um, interpretation at all, and that's why I mentioned my old neighborhood, Finsbury Pump. There were a lot of Irish people there and a lot of Cypriots who had every reason, in my opinion, a very justifiable reason, too, to be extremely annoyed with British foreign policy as it had affected their, their two partitioned uh, countries. Um, but they would never have stooped to the idea that this entitled them to let off explosives where their neighbors lived. And you only have to look and see at what the motive for the... Um, the well, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure it's the motive. Um, it hasn't been conclusively established yet of the uh, attempted atrocity in London last week was it was to try and kill as many young women as possible for their immodesty in going to nightclubs. Now, what on earth has that got to do with the sufferings of the people of Gaza, I'd like to know, or Kashmir, if it comes to that, or Chechnya? It's nothing but an excuse, and it's, um, it's the sort of intoxicating excuse-making and euphemism that's preached by irresponsible people who want to kill, I might add, all the Jews in England as well as all the Hindus. They're, they're making war not just on the United Kingdom, but on its largest democratic ally, and ours too, um, the secular democracy of India, which was the first target of Al-Qaeda. Let's hear from Aman in San Francisco. Welcome to Talk of the Nation. Aman, you're on the air. Yes, uh, I have a question for the gentleman, and I think uh, your view is kind of more, I mean, the people, I mean, you should... Uh, you are not explaining not all the Muslims, or but pretty much you are saying the Rishti, or uh, you are talking about the Monica Ali, and I don't think so. They are true Muslims. I mean, I'm not Muslim, or I don't. I'm not radical, or whatever. But the thing is, what make them radical? I mean, what have done to them in past centuries? And I think you go to the core of it and find out what make them and be, you know talk to them and be in a dialogue so they will understand that you are not their enemies. I am their enemy. I'm sorry. I have to insist upon it. Upon it. People who say they want to make the United Kingdom into an Islamic theocracy by force, and people who openly preach hatred and murder against the, our, our Jewish fellow citizens and our Indian Hindu fellow citizens um, are not my friends at all. I have nothing to talk to them about. And I don't listen to any excuses that they make for their criminal activity, and nor should you. So what's the solution, then? There is no solution, unfortunately. There is no solution. We're involved in a, in a war for civilization. Uh, the solution is, to, is to first to uh, be absolutely clear that we have every right to fight it and that what we are defending is worth fighting for. And uh, second, to, as I've just begun, tried to, begun to do, begin to do, uh, to deny any right uh, to these people uh, name any grievance that they think entitles them to take other people's lives. And the third is to say that we won't allow them to change our regime, but if they go on like this, we will change theirs. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that the, some of these uh, groups are supported by uh, other regimes. With the, until recently, there was one in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, we removed it. That's what I mean. It means that Muslim society must change, not secular society. Um. Considering the subtitle of your new book is How Religion Poisons Everything, yeah. is it is it uh, fundamentalism that you object to in all its forms? No. I mean, it, it's often convenient, people find it to be, at any rate, to say 
say this is done in the name of religion, as if it was somehow a perversion of religious teaching. I'm very sorry to say that the calls for jihad, for killing of apostates, uh, for, for preachments against non-Muslims and so on, actually are in the Quran, um, a book that all Muslims believe is the unalterable and final word of God. So the problem is with the religion itself. Christopher Hitchens is a contributing editor to Vanity Fair and author of the article London a Stand Calling in the June issue, which you can find a link to on our blog at npr.org slash blog the nation. He joined us from California. Thank you so much.